So our next speaker is Claire McCree, who is currently finishing her master's at the uh, Bard Graduate Center for Decorative Arts, Design, History, and, Cur and Material Culture. Her master's thesis, the debutante slouch, fashion and the female body in the United States, 1912 to 1925, focuses on the social history of posture, fashion, and issues of morality. She has a bachelor's degree in history from Wellesley College, and her areas of specialty include clothing and textile history, and American material culture of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, today, however, she'll be talking about Japanese material culture in a paper entitled The Meiji Kimono, Historical Context for the Adoption of Synthetic Dyes. Claire. While the invention of brightly colored synthetic dyes transformed women's fashions in Europe and America in the mid-19th century, it did not have the same immediate impact in Meiji Japan, 1868 to 1912. Although Japan had access to the vibrant colors of synthetic dyes by the early Meiji period, kimono fashions remained sober and conservative. In this talk, I will discuss Meiji politics, transformations in the textile industry, and attitudes towards Western clothing to explain the increasing national confidence and political stability that encouraged the eventual acceptance of synthetic dyes and their vibrant color palette. Three purple kimonos provide a case study for how the new dyes were used at different points in the Meiji era. These kimonos reveal a balance between retaining traditional motifs, colors, and layouts, and creatively responding to industrialization and the adoption of Western technology. The continuity and transformation represented by these kimonos parallels the continuity and transformation in Japan as a whole during the turbulent Meiji era. In my research, one issue I faced is that synthetic dyes cannot be definitively identified without chemical analysis. With the exception of curator Pamela Parmal at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, who has verified the presence of methyl dilate vi dye in a Meiji no costume from that collection, no one has conducted chemical research on dye stuffs in Meiji textiles. Throughout this paper, I have relied on my own educated opinion and the opinions of curators and experts to identify synthetic dye colors in the examples I present. While I was limited in working with primary sources because I do not read Japanese, I have instead completed an extensive survey of secondary literature on Japanese textiles and studied extant Meiji kimonos in museum collections. Englishman Sir William Henry Perkin created movine, the first aniline dye, in 1856. When he patented the dye and released it on the market in the following year, the novelty of its vivid color led it to achieve immediate popularity. Over the next decade, European chemists created synthetic dyes across the color spectrum. These dyes came to Japan quite soon after their invention. The first recorded usage of aniline colors in Japan took place in 1859 at a foreign-owned Kyoto dye shop. By 1862, Izutsuya Tadasuke, a dyer specializing in purple, had also begun to use synthetic dyes. Although the dyes had come to Japan, their vibrant colors did not immediately become fashionable. Most early Meiji kimonos remained conservative, tending toward dark indigo, gray, or brown. Meiji reforming efforts, intended to help Japan compete with the West as a world power, resulted in rapid political and social change that led to a sense of instability and uncertainty about national identity. The Meiji Restoration established the emperor as the head of a centralized parliamentary government, abolishing the feudal system that had governed Japan for centuries. Between 1868 and 1887, Meiji Japan instituted obligatory military service, mandatory primary education, and wrote its first constitution. The state's controversial separation of Buddhism and Shinto led to social unrest and rioting. Legislation of the early 1870s attempted to curb cultural practices that were considered backward, such as the wearing of top knots by men. Moreover, many of the abrupt legislative changes were continually revisited and revised furthering the confusion regarding what the modern Japanese state would look like. These reforms extended to social organization and dress as well. The Meiji emperor abolished hierarchies of social class 
and repealed long-standing sumptuary laws that restricted the wearing of fine fabrics, bright colors, and complex weaves to the samurai class. Western dress became an important aspect of this modernizing reform. In 1872, the emperor mandated Western clothing at court. Over the course of the Meiji era, almost all Japanese men adopted Western clothing for public wear, reserving the kimono for use at home. Most women, on the other hand, did not adopt Western dress, which in the 1870s was only worn by the court and members of the urban elite. Western fashions peaked in popularity for women during the Roku Meikan era of the mid 1880s. The Roku Meikan Hall, built to entertain foreign officials, opened in 1883 and became well known for balls that obligated guests to wear Western dress and perform Western social dances. The government officials who spearheaded the Roku Meikan effort hoped that it would prove to the West that the Japanese were civilized and cultured thus giving Japan more leverage in treaty negotiation. By the late 1880s and early 1890s, Western clothing had spread beyond elite women to include some of the middle class. Thus, throughout the early Meiji era, the question of adopting bright colors for the kimono was overshadowed by the more radical question of whether Western clothing would become the new national fashion. The Meiji reforms also encompassed the modernization of the textile industry. This initiative was framed as political progress. Indeed, one popular government slogan during this era was shokusan kogyo, or increasing production and encouraging industry. Government-sponsored trips to the West fostered the adoption of European textile technology. In 1872, three weavers vis visited Lyon returning to Japan with jacquard and fly shuttle looms. The government delegation to the 1873 Vienna World Exposition included two weavers who brought back more new technologies as well as chemical dyes. Eight students departed for France in 1877 to study Western textile techniques, including Inara Katsutaro, a dye specialist. New organizations also disseminated this knowledge. With the help of German and Dutch chemists, Kyoto established the Japanese Chemistry Bureau in 1870, and English and German chemists set up Tokyo University's chemistry department. Kyoto's Somei Dono, or dyeing palace, was founded in 1875 and taught the techniques of synthetic dyes to anyone who wanted to learn. The Japanese embraced Western textile technologies selectively and incorporated them into a Japanese cultural context. While they quickly adopted European weaving technology, they did not borrow European print textile printing techniques. Instead, importing the European chemical dyes enabled them to employ new mass production adaptations of traditional Japanese dyeing techniques. For instance, in 1879, Hirosa Jisuke discovered that the new chemical dyes could be mixed into the rice paste resist used in the traditional dye technique yuzen. Invented in the late 17th century, yuzen decoration involves hand-painted designs created with resist paste and dye. The resist would be applied to prevent the dye from coloring certain areas. The dye would be applied, and the resist would be washed out, and the steps repeated as needed with new colors. Jisuke's discovery led to the creation of a mass-produced version of yuzen called kata yuzen that saved labor by allowing the dye via resist paste to be applied directly through stencils. Japan participated in World's Fairs from 1873 onwards as a means of showcasing its national achievement. A textile sample book shown at the 1876 Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia demonstrates Japan's determination to show off its adoption of the new chemical colors. The traditional pine lozenge motif of this textile from the book suggests a commitment to combining the new color palette with existing cultural forms. The textile's woven patterning and extensive use of gold-wrapped thread suggest that this sample was produced for an elite audience, perhaps even the imperial family. While this sample book and imperial commissions indicate that Meiji Japan had incorporated synthetic colors into traditional elite forms by the 1870s, 
These examples raise the question of to what degree aniline textiles were employed by the broader public in this era. While the political and technological framework for mass producing brightly colored kimonos had largely developed by the early Meiji era, this clothing style did not immediately gain popularity. One major issue the government faced was the ability to bring reform outside of urban centers, which generally did not happen before the 1890s. Thus, ideals of progress and the new color palette that embodied them had limited influence. Much like Western clothing in this era, the new aniline colors may have been embraced at the elite level, but not necessarily by the general public. Furthermore, although sumptuary laws had been repealed, dress style had long been closely associated with social role, meaning that many people remained reluctant to wear styles once limited to the samurai class. An early Meiji kimono, decorated with auspicious minogame, or turtles, which symbolized longevity, demonstrates an early use of synthetic purple. Experts Tomoyuki Yamanobe and Kenzo Fuji assert that based on a visual analysis, this purple is a chemical dye. When compared with a palette of natural dyes, on the other hand, this purple looks remarkably similar to the color produced by Gromwell, the plant traditionally used to manufacture purple in Japan and indicated by the arrow at top. Dyeing from Gromwell was a labor-intensive process that made purple textiles prohibitively expensive. The introduction of chemistry knowledge from the West, coupled with research institutions such as the Japanese Chemistry Bureau, however, meant that the Japanese scientists had the ability to chemically manipulate synthetic dyes to achieve desired shades. Moreover, research conducted at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston has revealed that the Japanese used synthetic dyes not only to display the new brilliant chemical colors, but also for the purpose of recreating colors from the traditional dye palette. Thus, the wealthy merchant family who employed this kimono as a wedding costume could have chosen a purple synthetic dye altered to mimic the muted hue of Gromwell. On the other hand, it is possible that this garment was originally brighter and has since faded, Purples made using mauvine and methyl violet dye can fade to brown from exposure to light. A close examination of the garment, while not possible in this study, could clarify this issue. Interestingly, Yamanobe and Fuji identify the red used for the seaweed on this kimono as the natural dye sapin wood, indicated by the other arrow on the color palette, suggesting that natural and chemical dyes not only coexisted in Meiji Japan, but could even be employed in the same garment. While the new, bold aniline colors were uncommon in early Meiji fashions, they did gain popularity in woodblock prints, where they were associated with political and industrial progress. Beginning in the 1870s, many artists worked with the new chemical pigments, creating images where saturated red and purple dominate. These colorways frequently appeared in propaganda images of the imperial family and were called Kakushin no Iro, or Colors of Progress. Yoshu Chikanobu made extensive use of these chemical pigments in his 1887 print, A Contest of Elegant Ladies Among the Cherry Blossoms. Many of the women pictured wear bright purple, green, or scarlet trimmed clothing. Chikanobu also alludes to Japan's modernity by depicting the Western styles of the Roku Meikon era. In the late Meiji era, Synthetic dyes were incorporated into a new Japanese kimono aesthetic as greater political stability and increased confidence in the national project of modernization took hold. By the 1890s, Japan had largely achieved its goal of reforming national policy to be able to compete with the West. The government hoped in the next phase of reform to address social and economic issues and spread national sentiment throughout the country. Citizens began to express greater confidence and enthusiasm in defining Japanese identity and discussing prospects of empire. Moreover, Japan's victories in the Sino-Japanese War in 1895 and the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 to 1905 bolstered patriotism and faith that modernization had indeed led Japan to power and acclaim on the world stage. As part of this new nationalism, women were encouraged to adopt new roles. While upholding traditional virtues of filial piety, thrift, 
and modesty as good wives and wise mothers, women were also expected to be hardworking and productive in the new Japan, participating in patriotic or charitable organizations and making deposits in the national bank. With the emergence of these new ideals of Japanese modernity came a return to earlier ideals of feminine appearance. While men continued to wear Western clothing that they had adopted early in the Meiji era, by about 1890, women returned to wearing the kimono. Many felt that Japan had ventured too far in its imitation of the West and looked with nostalgia to past tradition. In contrast to the early Meiji dismissal of the preceding Edo period as backwards, late Meiji Japan viewed the Edo period as a pinnacle of cultural achievement. In February 1889, the newspaper Tokyo Nichi Nichi announced that Western women's clothing was no longer fashionable. Rumors of scandal among the Roku Meikan's regulars, as well as the failure of treaty negotiations, brought about the end of the westernizing Roku Meikan era. By 1900, Western women's clothing had become rare enough to meet with ridicule in the street. Thus, in this era, a return to the kimono now self-consciously defined as Japanese national dress in opposition to Western clothing, coincided with an era of increased faith in modernization and national fervor. In this era, further technological developments in dyeing adapted traditional techniques for modern Japan, allowing for cultural continuity in clothing decoration and democratizing elaborate patterning, previously only achievable with hours of handwork. New methods for traditional techniques, such as shibori, enabled these patterning methods to flourish in the clothing industry of the early 20th century, which increasingly favored high volume, rapid production, and the department store retail model. This national confidence and enthusiasm for Japanese progress encouraged greater willingness to experiment with the kimono. Innovations in kimono decoration involved the incorporation of bright synthetic colors, along with bold patterns, and reinterpretations of Art Nouveau or Vienna Secession designs. This bright purple kimono from the 1880s or 1890s exemplifies the sartorial changes that had occurred since the early Meiji era. In contrast to the Minogame dis kimono discussed earlier, this kimono is a brighter purple, more true to the possibilities of the synthetic dye palette. A comparison of this kimono with an 1896 sample card of chemical dyes reveals the similarity between this color and the chemical colors offered. This similarity is especially striking when juxtaposed with the muted purple of the Minogame kimono. Like the Minogame kimono, this kimono depicts a traditional motif, pine trees in a landscape inhabited by auspicious creatures such as cranes and Minogame, and employs the traditional layout with the design concentrated on the sleeve and hem. The decoration on this kimono, however, has been applied using woodblock printing in addition to yuzen and embroidery. This particular combination of techniques of hand and mass production, while unusual, existed within a larger context in the Meiji era where traditional handwork methods coexisted with new methods such as kata yuzen. An even brighter purple kimono from 1908 shows the continuing innovation in kimono fashions during the late Meiji era. This brilliant purple, sometimes called azuki iro, after the auspicious red-purple azuki beans eaten to celebrate the new year, became popular at the turn of the century and took full advantage of the synthetic dye palette. This kimono, unlike the other two we have discussed, depicts Western flowers rather than traditional motifs. Western orchids, violets, and poppies became fashionable in early 20th century Japan after textile designers saw these blossoms displayed at the St. Louis World's Fair of 1904. This willingness to employ Western motifs marks a definite departure from the kimonos of the early Meiji era. Nonetheless, this kimono retains many markers of Japanese-ness and tradition in its kimono shape, auspicious color, and layout of decoration. By the end of the Meiji period, greater innovation in kimono color and decoration set the stage for the bolder graphics that would be made fashionable by the department stores of the Taisho era, 1912 to 1926. Although Japan had access to the vibrant colors of synthetic dyes by the early Meiji period, 
the political and social instability of this era, along with the debate over the adoption of Western clothing, precluded any progressive movement to modernize the kimono or any widespread desire to adopt the new palette. By the 1890s, however, increased national confidence and faith in Japanese, Japan's modernization process, accompanied by the reestablishment of the kimono as the primary garment for women, created a historical context that encouraged the adoption of the vivid Western colors and Western motifs in fashionable kimono. This history highlights how the struggle for Japanese identity, a fraught issue in Meiji Japan, manifested in everyday life. Moreover, it provides a fascinating glimpse into the process of cross-cultural borrowing and shows how a culture's adoption of new technologies does not result in a loss of cultural authenticity, but rather encourages both continuity and creative adaptation. <laughs>